Lisa, I think one of the most interesting things as we talk about your new book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, you start out in talking about the pervasive and aggressive marketing of wellness goods and services. We're bombarded by the wellness industry. How does that make teens and parents feel? I think it runs the risk of confusing what mental health really is. And part of what compelled me to write this book is that so often these days, being mentally healthy is equated with feeling good or calm or relaxed. And those are all good things, but those actually have very little to do with how we understand mental health as psychologists. For us, mental health is about two other things. The first is having feelings that fit the circumstance, and the second is managing those feelings well. So if your kid's best friend moves away and they are very sad, that would be evidence of their mental health. We would expect to see distress. And what we're gonna to wanna to see is that they handle those feelings in a way that brings them relief and does no harm, maybe crying a little, talking about their feelings, seeking comfort, versus a kid who acts out or is miserable to everyone or turns against themselves, decides that all bad things happen to me, I must be no good. Yeah. All we're looking for is how the distress is managed. We're actually quite a bit less interested in the presence or absence of distress. We expect it to be part of life. You write in the book, the $131 billion global wellness economy has now outpaced the $100 billion global entertainment industry. We are bombarded yeah. with this idea that we need to fix all of these different things mm -hmm. in order to feel well that we equate then with our mental health. It's true, and I've cared for teenagers for a long time, but it's only in the last, I'd say, five to 10 years that I now care for teenagers who feel that they have somehow failed at wellness if they are feeling stressed or unhappy. And of course, there's so much that can lead anyone to feel stressed and unhappy from time to time. And it, um, it sort of breaks my heart that they feel like somehow this should have been avoidable or avoided. Yeah. I mean, in knowing you for so many years and having read your books, that has been a light bulb moment for me, that we have become, uh, we have started to demonize, if you will, stress anxiety, sadness, mm -hmm. anger, when mm -hmm. in fact, these are normal feelings. Normal and often <laughs> actual evidence of mental health. If a young person has a huge test the next day and they have not started studying, we expect to see anxiety. The presence of anxiety lets us know that kid is working perfectly. And so often right now, distress is equated with a mental health concern. And that's very rarely the case. We can have mental health concerns, but we really also look at how is the person managing? Those two things matter. This book has so many mm -hmm. uh, helpful things for, for parents, for teens, for everybody. In chapter one, you write about adolescent emotion and getting past the three big myths. So let's talk about those. Myth number one, emotion is the enemy of reason. That's kind of what we were just talking about. Yeah, yeah we worry that Somehow our teenagers' moods are gonna get in the way of their lives or their good thinking. And what we know is that most of the time, our moods inform our decisions, and usefully so. And we should pay attention to what we know from our feelings and integrate that with what we know from other sources of information to make the best choices. Right, that stress that I might fail the test mm -hmm. actually makes me study harder. Yeah, it's good information. Myth number two, difficult emotions are bad for teens. Should teens be shielded from emotional pain? First of all, you can't even if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, most of the time, it helps them grow, right? When a teenager goes through a painful breakup, it's really hard to watch, but it's often in those moments that they get to know themselves well, that they deepen their connections to their friends, and that they actually learn that they are built to withstand a surprising amount of distress under the right conditions and it actually helps them to be sturdier and stronger going forward. Myth number three, teens are psychologically fragile. Yeah, it's hard. Teenagers' moods go up and down and they can go all over the map before 9 a.m. And I think for parents, they can worry that something's really wrong, you know, that their mood is all over the place. The only time we worry about a teenager's mood is if it goes to a concerning place and stays there. We do not expect to see teenagers feeling down or paralyzed by anxiety over days, or we worry if they're using what I call costly coping, if they're coping in a way that's gonna come at a price, such as abusing substances or being hard on others or hard on themselves. Everything else is the rich and spicy business of being a typically developing teenager. Mm -hmm. 
And how do, because you write about gender differences, mm -hmm. how do girls deal with anger over their emotional development? You write about how it changes. It's true. So what we see is that in younger children, boys are more likely to express anger than girls. In adolescence, it flips. Girls are more likely to express anger than boys. There is one form of anger, though, that girls express at a higher rate across the entire range of development, and it's disdain. Hmm. So I thought that was actually a very amusing <laughs> research finding <laughs> that tracks with my experience. <laughs> and what would be an example that you could share about disdain? Saying you're so basic, yeah. <laughs> something like that, <laughs> or just a good old eye roll. <laughs> yes, I've noticed that. Yeah. I've noticed that. Um, chapter three is all about adolescent life. And I think many people may not know that adolescence is from age 11 to age 24. Yes. You and I have talked about this. This is something my mother talks about. The brain develops until about age 25. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are so concerned about what happens in that period of time, even with recreational drug or alcohol yeah. use. Yeah, it's true. So adolescence begins earlier than people think. Everybody pegs it to 13. We have always marked the beginning of adolescence right around puberty. And puberty is underway in most teenagers by 11, even if you can't see the outward signs. Mm -hmm. And it's important for people to know that because their adolescents, their 11 year olds are acting like teenagers and people worry something's wrong. Nothing's wrong, the kid's right on time. Their brain is developing and changing and it's a pretty elaborate renovation project. And it starts in the lower order regions of the brain that really are the functions. Emotion is a big function of that part of the brain. And it progresses over time to the higher order regions where perspective maintaining and planning are. And so there, it takes a long time for all of that renovation to happen. And the renovation is not totally complete until around age 24. But it's also true, Nora, that when a teenager is calm, their brain works great. Mm -hmm. It's when they get stirred up that the more sophisticated regions are more likely to be knocked offline. Mm -hmm. That's true in adults, too. Yeah. 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 Um, chapter four is, is, I think, the useful information, too. How can we help our teens manage their emotions? What are some tips for people? How do we help teens deal with those ups and downs? So when psychologists think about this question, we approach it from the side of what we call emotion regulation. So you can't get rid of distress, you can't keep it from arriving, but you can regulate it. Getting feelings out, as teenagers say, is part of how they get relief. This is getting them talking, responding in a way that they want to keep talking to us, which is largely being empathic and interested. And also honoring the fact that a lot of teenagers use nonverbal forms of expression. I had a mom say to me not too long ago, you know, my son comes home from school and he has to play basketball for an hour to blow off steam until he can sit down to his homework. And that's such a beautiful example of this boy expressing and discharging the frustrations of the day in a way that brings relief and does no harm. And as long as those two boxes are checked, it's good by me. Yeah, that seems like a pretty healthy way yeah, to deal like with it. stress and anxiety from, from school. Um, what's the right way to have a conversation about sex, drugs, and alcohol? <laughs> I think the thing we have to keep in mind is that we can't sneak up on teenagers and hope it's going to go well. So if you want to have that conversation, you probably should give your kid fair warning, and it should probably be short. More effective is waiting for them to start the conversation, which they do, but they don't always start it in the ways that we're expecting. Often, they will start it by mentioning something that's happening in their classmates. They'll say, you know, I heard so-and-so was smoking weed, or I hear this person's hooking up with a lot of people. And they are throwing the door open in those moments. And it often catches parents off guard. And what I have found to be a very reliable way to kind of get your feet and buy some time is to say to your kid, huh, what do you think about that? And you can get them laying out their thinking and do a little thinking yourself. But what I think often happens is parents are so caught off guard when teenagers bring up what other teenagers are doing that they respond sort of strongly or they don't know what to say. And it is often a missed opportunity. Right. So rather than shutting down the conversation by uh, allowing your opinion to come out about what you may think about that behavior, mm -hmm. instead ask your teenager to explore what they think about their yeah. behavior and express their values. Yeah, and usually when teenagers are bringing up something like that, they're trying to get a read on it. Often what's happening is that other kids seem okay with it and your kid's not so sure. So they may sort of be casual, like, ah, I hear there's some eighth graders 
and weed gummies going around. And it can seem like they don't get it, that it's a big deal. But usually they're putting it out that way to try to get a read on how serious this is. And so it really is often enough to say, wow, I'm kind of surprised. What do you think? And do it in a not strong reactive way. And kids will say, I don't know. It's kind of weird. You can usually get a good conversation going. But they're bringing it up because they want to talk about it. But they don't always seem to indicate that they take it as seriously as we want them to. But I wouldn't let that stop you from assuming they, is, they realize it's a big deal. I'm paraphrasing this, but I think you write somewhere sort of be a good listener, a really good listener at some yeah. point. There's yeah. a whole you know, sub-chapter on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to be a good listener. When our kids are telling us upsetting things, we do want to fix it and we do respond. The um, trick I use myself as a mom is that when one of my teenage daughters is talking to me, I try to imagine that she's a reporter and I'm her editor and she is reading me the article of what's on her mind or the article of what's made her upset. And my job at the end of the article is to try to produce the headline, to summarize it, to distill it, but not to add anything, to just say something that really sums up what she was sharing. That's how I can make myself be a better listener, and that's often how we can show to teenagers that we were really listening. So do you mean you're sort of validating by restating yes. and putting a headline on it, yeah. which is that so you're feeling really down because your friends exactly. left you out of the party? Exactly. I tell a story in this book. My older daughter was a sophomore in high school when the pandemic hit, and about three or four weeks in, the full scope of what was happening hit her. And she got very upset and had basically a rant, you know, said, oh my gosh, they took away dances and lunch and after school activities and everything fun. And they left us tests and APs and lectures. They took away everything that made school fun and they just left us school. And I did a good job that day and listened like an editor. And at the end of it, I said, man, it's like school is all vegetables and no dessert. And she said, yes. And at least for that 10 minutes, she got what she needed. You and I have talked about this before, but what determines whether a teen can succeed emotionally? And it's about having an adult in your life that can help you. Explain that. Yeah. So, you know, we're thinking about mental health and teenagers all the time. And for me, one of the most reassuring findings we have is that the strongest force for adolescent mental health is a caring relationship with an adult. Doesn't have to be your parent. No, and it's not gonna be the parent for every kid. And so what does a caring relationship look like? That person takes the teenager seriously, is interested in the teenager, assumes best intentions in the teenager. And my experience of teenagers is they rise to expectations, but they also sink to them. So if we treat teenagers disrespectfully, don't be surprised if they're not always so respectful in their response. But my experience is when you really honor teenagers and show that you're interested in who they are as sort of unique individuals, they really appreciate it and they really grow in that context. Can be a teacher, can be a coach, can be at somewhere where your summer job is. All of those types of adults can really also be a lifeline for a teen in mental health distress. It's so true. And what I love about that is that it means that everyone has a role to play in getting us through this mental health crisis with teens. We are not going to be able to provide enough therapy for every kid who needs it. The way we're gonna get out of this mental health crisis with teenagers is by strengthening the relationship between teenagers and the adults who are right around them. Lisa DeMora, congratulations on your new book and thank you so much. Thank you.